Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the Fall 2023 Meet the Fellows program at the Kogut Institute for the Humanities. I'm Peter Sandy, David Hurley, Professor of Comparative Literature and the Humanities. Every year, the Institute holds scholars at all stages of their career, faculty, undergraduates, doctoral candidates, and postdocs, scholars who represent disciplines across the humanities and the humanistic social sciences. These scholars pursue individual research projects over the course of the year, and they come together in person every week to share work in progress, provide each other feedback, and build scholarly community. This evening's event is an opportunity to get a glimpse of the vitality of the humanistic research at Brown. The Fellows Program is made possible through the generous support of many, Thanks are due in particular to the Mellon Foundation for helping the Institute to create endowed funds for postdoctoral fellowships, graduate research, and the Collaborative Humanities Initiative. We also thank the many individual donors who have helped the Institute to sustain and in some cases endow its programs and initiatives. As we move into the talks, I'll introduce the speakers in small groups. We invite you to think about how the talks speak to one another, either by revealing shared methodologies or concerns, or by shedding an unexpected light on each other's assumptions, aims, or findings. So first up, we'll have Ravit Reichmann. Ravit is Associate Professor of English she is currently completing a study titled Possessive Cases, the Propertied Imagination in Modern Times, which offers a genealogy of property's expansive role in our psychic life, beginning with more conventional notions of property and ending in ideas of property restitution as a vehicle for justice. Our second speaker will be James Langan, an undergraduate studying comparative literature and anthropology. His senior thesis, provisionally entitled Rereading Modernity, Spectres of Cannibalism in the Caribbean Avant-Garde, traces the epistemological and ontological formation of a modern and modernist Caribbean through the figure of the cannibal. Please enjoy these first two talks. Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you, Peter, for, for your lovely introduction, and to everybody at COGUT for bringing us together this semester. Uh, my work is situated at the intersection of literature and law, and at the COGUT, as Peter mentioned, I'll be working on a book entitled Possessive Cases, The Propertied Imagination in Modern Times, which examines how property animates a narrative and ethical imagination. Why do we come to feel possessive over intangibles, nations, identity, memory that legally we can't own? How and why does property become a means of doing justice in the modern world, as well as a source and barometer of injustice? These questions lie at the heart of the study, which makes two related claims. First, that property in the modern era comes into view predominantly through loss rather than acquisition. And second, that many of our contemporary anxieties and debates can be understood as forms of property disputes and are best interpreted using property's grammar. The central notion of my project is the property imagination, which refers to the lens that turns our world, our experiences, and ourselves into possessions and makes us feel possessive over things we can't own. It's the idea that we can't think ourselves outside of property, we speak property's language all the time and think in possessive cases. When we talk, for example, about having a sense of belonging or entitlement, being self-possessed, appropriating another culture, or owning our actions or emotions, we can no more think our way out of property than we can excise the possessive case from our language. It's not hard to see why the 20th century became an era of dispossession rather than acquisition. In a period of industrialization, mass transportation, and mechanized warfare, everyone was always going somewhere, by force or by choice. People were on the move within growing cities and between home front and war front. 
The writer E.M. Forster in his novel Howard's End referred to his generation as a civilization of luggage, luggage that was increasingly left behind in trains, automobiles, and buses. Um, I just want to share my screen. Um, by mid-century, however, it became harder to attach the word civilization to the transitoriness that Forster associated with property. His civilization of luggage would take a darker turn, overshadowed by the piles of luggage, uh, shoes, or combs confiscated from Jewish victims of Nazi Germany. The personal effects that convey the history of atrocity are often things that have no place in anyone's inventory, though they're occasionally claimed by history and art, housed in museums or memorialized in images like those by photographer Tom Kiefer, a janitor at a US Customs and Border Protection Processing Facility in Arizona, who collected the belongings of migrants seized by border control in 2003. Displayed in the 2019 exhibition, El Sueño Americano, The American Dream, Kiefer's assemblages figure as chilling after images of the piles of shoes, combs, and eyeglasses in the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem, or the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC. These ordinary objects pierce us, not by virtue of their materiality, but in their status as possessions. They once belonged to someone who is no more or whose life was hollowed out by dispossession. As property became a marker of loss over the 20th century, it also expanded conceptually into things that feel like property, but exist beyond law's reach. So while the book's genealogy of the property imagination begins with more conventional examples of possessions like real estate or personal effects, it moves on to consider memory, identity, and the nation as forms of property made legible through stories of dispossession, for example, in recovered memory cases or identity theft. It's not that these non-legal things function like property, but that we experience memory, identity, or citizenship as property. We feel possessive over them, claim them as ours, and go to great lengths to be reunited with them. One way to conceptualize the modern era, I submit, is to see it as a series of experiments in ownership, trials and errors in taking possession of things that may or may not be ours to own, and that shed light on the intimate geography of the modern condition. Thanks for listening. Um, thank you so much for having me, and thank you, Professor Sandy, for that introduction. Uh, my name is James. I'm one of the undergraduate fellows here at the Kogut Institute, and I study comparative literature and anthropology. And what I will be introducing today is sort of a, a peek at what will eventually materialize into a senior thesis in comparative literature. So I'm, as a student, I'm most broadly interested in the various theoretical, philosophical, and, and literary movements that sprout out of the end of the 19th century into the beginning and the middle of the 20th century. So more specifically, that means modernist and avant-garde literatures, um, post-colonial studies, and the sort of like melting pot of philosophies and theories that we come to call critical theory. Um, in my comparative literature studies, I work mostly between French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Um, and these three languages sort of violently, but also very beautifully clash and converge in a geog geographical space that we refer to as Latin America and the Caribbean. So as you can imagine, as a Kogut fellow, I'll be researching and comparing avant-garde texts produced in French, Spanish, and Portuguese in Latin America and the Caribbean. The title of my project is Rereading Modernity, Specters of Cannibalism in the Caribbean Avant-Garde. And I know cannibalism can be a provocative idea. It initially fills us with sort of discomfort, if not disgust. But in the Latin American context, I argue, cannibalism has an incredibly rich history of being used as a metaphor. The act of cannibalism, this idea of biting into and consuming another, pushes us to reconsider how we consume and digest texts within greater paradigms of cultural exchange across languages and borders. This is perhaps most famously the case in Brazil, where in 1928, a poet by the name of Oswald de Andrade publishes the Manifesto Antropófago, the Cannibalist Manifesto. It's a short essay that calls for Brazilians to devour their European predecessors and to produce a distinctly Latin American literary tradition. There's one iconic line from the manifesto I want to underline very quickly, which is tupi or not tupi, that's the question. It's from this epithet that a good chunk of my interest has blossomed because Andrade is taking a line from Hamlet, to be or not to be, and he's replacing to be with tupi, T-U-P-I, which was an indigenous group that inhabited Brazil uh, before colonial contact and that was known to practice cannibalistic rituals. 
So here Andrade is eating Shakespeare. He's sort of biting and swallowing Hamlet, and he shamelessly regurgitates him into the figure of the Tupi cannibal. What interests me here is the, the temporal nature of this consumption, because these scraps of European, African, and indigenous presence that we understand to exist across Latin American, Latin American history are the remnants of a colonial past that, that per persists in the, in the present and the future. So these are specters. They're ghostly, they haunt, and they elude conventional means of articulating existence and presence. The history of colonialism has a very material, like very easily identifiable material legacy, but it's actually this non-present present that haunts avant-garde movements I'm seeing. And it sort of tracks these writers that are hoping to produce literature that critiques their society and that sort of explains the ills that we face as we modernize. We see a similar tension in parts of the Caribbean, so in Cuba and also in on the island of Martinique, where the writer Suzanne César, for example, is declaring that modern Martinican literature must be cannibalistic, actually, if it is to exist at all. So she draws from contemporary currents of French surrealism and this complex dynamic history of African traditions and produces a literature that suspends her subjects, to borrow from Fanon, another Martinican thinker, in a zone of non-being. That's to say that to cannibalize is not only to confuse being, but also time. We devour the past, we digest it in the present and we regurgitate it into the future. We throw into flight all preconceived notions of time being and ultimately origin. So my big question here is, how does the Caribbean eat with ghosts? By that I mean, how does the act of cannibalism unsettle but also deepen our understanding of how the specters of the past influence how texts are produced, consumed and circulated through a modernizing economy? I'm thankful um, to the COGIT for giving me a chance to speak today and give you all a taste of what's to come. So to speak, um, and I'm thrilled at, at what lies ahead this year uh, as a co fellow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ravit and James, for starting off the evening with these two wide-ranging and, and illuminating projects. Let's turn to our next group of talks. Lucia Kahn-Sperling is an undergraduate concentrating in modern culture and media and English literature. Her honors thesis, tentatively titled Digital Reading Writing in the Poetry of Tan Lin, explores the relationship between language, technology, and subjectivity, focusing on the work of Tan Lin, an American contemporary poet of Chinese origins. And Ambra Marzocchi is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Classics and the Kogut Institute for the Humanities, also affiliated with the Center for the Study of the Early Modern World. At the Kogut Institute, she's exploring the transmission of Greco-Roman, pagan, and Christian literatures in colonial Mexico. Hi. Um, thank you so much for that introduction, Peter. Um, my name is Lucia, and I'm an undergraduate senior at Brown studying modern culture and media and English. Um, the title of my thesis keeps changing, so I've just presented these four terms here, um, and investigating the relationship between them is going to be my central project. Um, so I'm just going to dive right into the material I've been working with, um, since I think that's the most efficient way to show what my project is about. What are the forms of non-reading, and what are the non-forms a reading might take? Poetry equals wallpaper. Novel equals design object. Text as ambient soundtrack. Duchamp wanted to create works of art that were non-retinal. It would be nice to create works of literature that didn't have to be read, but could be looked at, like placemats. The most exasperating thing in a poetry reading is always the sound of a poet reading. This passage opens up contemporary poet Tan Lin's book, Seven Controlled Vocabularies and Obituary, 2004, The Joy of Cooking, published in 2010. Um, I'm not going to do a close reading for the sake of time, but these kinds of declarations and prose formations are repeated with changes throughout the book in what could be described as an iterative process, both in the computational and the linguistic sense. In these aesthetic edicts, Lynn advocates for poetic texts that imitate the forms of expression found in greeting cards, video monitors turned off, and central air conditioning, among other things. Um, so this suggests that all of these different objects can act as containers for the same kind of encounter. Perhaps we could call this reading, perhaps looking, perhaps writing, or something else. This potential something else is related to the word ambient in this passage, which I will come back to later. 
The work Seven Controlled Vocabularies itself has been proliferated or iterated across many different media. In addition to being a physical book, it has appeared as a video installation, which you can see on the left, and editions of the book have also been released as free PDFs online, with the encouragement to readers to re-upload for their own republication. Here we could view the language within the poems as information turned into data, able to be passed between media or users without corruption. But there's also a material specificity to these different formats, which you can start to see just by looking at these images. Um, and this is one of the central tensions I'm interested in. Using Google Translate, the book was also translated into Chinese and then back into English um, and published in those editions. There is a self-reflexive structure here in the sense of a recursive algorithm or a cybernetic feedback loop. And there's also an explicit expansion of the notion of poetic authorship to include technology itself. There are many images in the book, many of which contain text. Sometimes this text is illegible because the image is too small or too pixelated, creating a slippage between text and image or reading and looking um, that feels reminiscent of how we encounter infinitely reproduced and proliferated signs in the digital landscape or in a culture that seems to be turning ever more toward the visual. And then here's another example of a two page spread from the book where we have a troubling of the distinction between writing, image, and code. So going off of these couple examples from the book, I'm interested in how Tan Lin's work can help us understand reading, which I'm using here as an expanded term that could also encompass looking and writing, um, how we might understand reading as a digital technology. In my thesis project, I plan to read his poetry through writing on cybernetic theory and digital structures as they relate to theories of language. A central concept I'll have to deal with here is ambience, a word Lin has often used both in and outside his poetry. Most relevant to my research is the concept of ambient poetics, coined by Timothy Morton to describe a form of ecological awareness. I'm interested in parsing the relationship here between the ecological and the technological. Ambient media has often been generalized as producing a sort of diffuse boundary dissolving affect. I hope to complicate this a bit by focusing also on the importance of form and structure in Lin's work, the tension between form and formlessness, and also between boredom and frustration, which I hope will also inform my conclusions about the nature of digital subjectivity in general. Um, and I'm very excited to work through these ideas in the COVID seminar this year. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Peter, for your introduction. And thanks to the Cocote Institute for giving me the opportunity to share with you all and, and with the audience uh, the essentials of my research at Brown University. I am Ambra Marzocchi, uh, an international humanities postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Classics and at the Center for the Study of the Early Modern World uh, in uh, the Cocote Institute. And during my fellowship here, um, I am deepening and I am expanding a research project on uh, colonial humanities that began with my doctoral dissertation. And that will be uh, now um, greatly enhanced uh, thanks to the um, expertise and the bibliographical collections of Brown University. My research deals with the classical pedagogy and with the reception in early modern times of Greco-Roman learning, literature, and thought in the New World, and specifically in New Spain. Uh, that is how Mexico was called in its three colonial centuries immediately after um, the encounter and clash between the European invaders and the native populations. What I'm specifically interested in studying is when and how European uh, humanist education of Renaissance times, which, uh, um, as is well known, was uh, strongly hinged on um, uh, Greek and Latin authors and on Christian morals, um, when it was transferred into the new setting of the post-colonial, um, post-conquest Mexico. Um, this setting was obviously um, socially, politically, uh, culturally, and uh, linguistically uh, very complex and very different uh, from the classical and uh, the European uh, one. So this leads me to investigate which modifications needed to be applied to the pedagogical contents and the methods established in Europe uh, in order to make uh, these uh, Greco-Roman texts uh, um, available, uh, suitable, 
and even acceptable uh, in the new context. Um, my research chooses to interrogate the history of their area uh, from a twofold perspective. Naturally, the perspective of the European educators uh, who were uh, missionaries uh, belonging to several religious orders, Franciscans, Jesuits, and others, uh, but also the perspective of the recipient of such education, the youth in the Mexican classrooms. And I am particularly keen in exploring this side of the colonial pedagogical relationship, and in order to do so, I am mainly guided by the kind of primary sources that might be able to um, elucidate uh, at best the mutual cultural contributions involved in the teaching of the humanist disciplines in 16th and 17th century in Mexico. Uh, dealing with schools and with lessons, such sources for me uh, will naturally be the textbooks. The very textbooks that were used in the colonial classrooms to teach Latin and Greek to the youth of Mexico. Unfortunately, many of these Latin grammars of Latin and Greek anthologies and uh, humanist manuals uh, do survive. And we are lucky to have numerous of them in the special collections of uh, the libraries in Brown University. Now, one idea I would like to test, especially with this research that I'm doing at the Cogut Institute and at Brown University is whether the colonial Greek and Latin textbooks uh, can be investigated as primary sources um, in order to discover the traits of uh, the colonial Mexican society as, um, in, its, in its multifold ethnicity, which was made of Spaniards, but also of indigenous, and it, in its linguistic and its cultural um, extraordinary variety. And I already envisioned that for this inquiry, um, it will be very uh, fruitful and uh, intriguing, certainly, for me to interact uh, with uh, other Cogut Fellows in uh, this year's cohort. I'm looking very forward to it. Um, meanwhile, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much for these talks, exploring the multiple impacts, resonances, or politics of literary and textual forms and, and genres. Next, we have two fellows whose work reads commemorative and religious stonework in new and inventive ways. Itamar Levin is a doctoral candidate in the departments of classics, specializing in ancient history. His work is situated within broader scholarly conversations about the role of power in shaping cultural practices, his dissertation focuses on cenotaphs in ancient Greek society and their role in instrumentalizing the absent dead for civic ideological purposes. And next, Andrew Liu is an undergraduate concentrating in comparative literature, English and French, and the history of art and architecture. His thesis project, titled Devouring Stone, Rethinking the Monstrous in Romanesque Monastic Sculpture, examines the carved stone creatures of 20th century Languedoc monasteries and their paradoxical proliferation in religious spaces. Let's start with Itamar. As mentioned, I'm Itamar Levin, a PhD candidate in classics, specializing in ancient history. And today, I want to take you on a journey into the heart of ancient Greece. We're talking about over 1,000 diverse settlements scattered throughout the Mediterranean and Black Sea. But what makes a political community into a polis? The traditional answer, a city-state, an urban center with certain political or religious institutions. But this conceptualization is unsatisfying since the ancient Greeks themselves believed that the police is first and foremost the people. My study 
delves into the development, spread, and ramifications of civic ideology in ancient Greek society. To this end, I target the politics of commemoration and specifically cenotaphs or empty tombs. I argue that from the seventh to the fourth century BCE, ancient Greece became what I term a cenotaphic society, a society in which cenotaph possess unique force in shaping identity, either by valorizing the missing dead or by allowing a plurality of memories, creating a mnemonic web, if you will. This definition explains the unique positions cenotaphs possess hold in the process of demos formation. First, they enable celebrating an absent dead whose lack of remains stems from their sacrifice to the community. Um, second, whereas a person can have only one tomb, they can be memorialized also through cenotaphs. The different modes of commemoration shed light on the metrics of ideological forces shaping society. The analysis of cenotaphs indeed revealed changes between locations and periods. The earliest cenotaphs of civic nature we have appear already in the archaic period, all in colonies. We are talking about grand empty monuments for generals and diplomats who died during their civic un undertaking, and therefore their death was considered a sacrifice. Similar cenotaphic constructions were erected in mainland Greece only in the aftermath of the Persian invasions, with the worded having been buried near the battlefield, states resolved to bring the memory of the fallen home via war cenotaphs, emphasizing their contribution to the collective effort of the Greeks. Now, in the classical period, war dead were traditionally buried en masse, following civic ideals of, of, uh, of unity and solidarity. Families subsequently had to honor their dead with, uh, with a private tomb, empty tomb, and a private plot. Those, those cenotaphs don't compete with the mass graves, but the two work in tandem within the civic mindset. Even family cenotaphs for Athenian horsemen, the elite of ancient society, show an acceptance rather than a rejection of civic ideology. In sum, cenotaphs mirror the so-called rise of the polis, as well as the implications, the impact of civic ideology's growing dominance on the construction of identity. In all cases under discussion, lack of remains is not contingent nor circumstantial, but the direct result of the commemorative practices of the time that necessitated the eruption of an empty tomb. This transformation of ancient Greece into a cenotaphic society attests to a multi-layered discourse as the different commemorative techniques correspond with the social forces, the different social forces acting on and shaping individual lives at the household, police, and panhellenic levels. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Peter, for that introduction. And thank you, Itamar, for that um, fascinating presentation. I'm just going to share my screen very quickly. All right. My name is Andrew Liu. Um, I'm an undergraduate fellow studying comparative literature and history of art and architecture. And this is a little bit about my thesis project on 12th century monastic sculpture. A large stone pillar in the mostly forgotten Abbey Church of saint marie de Suyac in South Central France has been described by various art historians and commentators as, quote, the most compelling of all Romanesque sculptural groups, unquote. One that is without equal in terms of decoration and form. The early 12th century pillar, or more accurately, Trumeau, is composed of two columns of hunting beasts, identified as griffins and lions, intertwined in a crisscross pattern and framed by bent colonnettes that seem as if on the very verge of collapse. 
standing erect on each other's backs, claws gripping and beady eyes agape. The animals twist their necks 180 degrees in the opposite direction of their torsos to bite with sharp beaks and toothy mouths, hopeless praise that cascade down this rapacious lithic spiral. Curiously, at the apex of the scene, as you can see on the right side of the screen here, a naked human figure struggles between two beasts, his face contorted in an expression of heightened agony that I believe opens up surprising and perhaps unsettling possibilities for the experience of medieval art. My thesis in the Department of History of Art and Architecture deals with such sculptural depictions of devoured humans in 12th century Benedictine monasteries in the Languedoc, focusing on their embodied reception by a range of beholding subjects. Despite their grotesque and seemingly profane or even sacrilegious nature, carved stone beasts and monsters proliferated in Romanist monasteries, which in the 11th and 12th century served as nuclei for the resurgence of monumental sculpture much to the chagrin of monastic reformers, such as Bernard of Clairvaux, who denounced such excessive decorations as, quote, that ridiculous monstrosity, unquote. What is so curious about the particular monstrosity of the Suyak Trumeau is that it resists reading or glossing in the traditional iconographic sense. It has no real precedent, no genealogy of interpretation, no clear biblical reference or exegetical anchor. It invites, as art historian Mayor Shapiro writes, no systematic intellectual apprehension and its forms are grasped not as units that form a coherent, syntactically organized utterance, but as individual, often irrational fantasies, as single thoughts and sensations. In its illegibility and tenuous relationship to textuality, the Suyak Trumeau positions itself in the margins of Romanesque art, ambiguous, fugitive, defiant. Central to the Suyak Trumeau then is a mystery, a lack of recognition and enigma. And like with, um, with that great foundational mystery of Christianity, the incarnation of God into the human body of Jesus Christ, perhaps we must return to the flesh, re-inhabit and reanimate it to begin to understand the ostensibly unmediated mystery of this monstrous sculpture. My project on Suyak will operate thus around the body as the body itself circumnavigates the sculpture, literally walking around it since it is carved on three sides and designed to engender an ambulatory viewing experience. Regarding the relationship among beholder and image, the operative here, a word here being regarding, I'm interested in issues of spectacle, hunt, and the fragmentation of self, especially the processes of desire, devouring, digestion, dissolution, dispersion, and death that attend all three. Thinking through various theoretical frameworks, notably disability studies and critical animal studies, I hope to unearth in the anti iconography of the Suyak Trumeau something akin to a meaningful encounter a poetics perhaps of appetite, displacement, and interlacing, where inexhaustible equivocal meanings are freed to disperse from the central enigma of the image in stone. Thank you. Thank you both for these talks that auscultate, so to speak, the political and cultural memory of forms carved in stone, but resuscitating them and making them come alive for, for today. And to wrap up the evening, we have two talks that investigate the symbolic implications of film and literature. Brianna Eaton is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Africana Studies. Her dissertation project examines symbols of blackness in film and television in the 21st century, focusing on how visual markers of race link representations of blackness across political borders and geographies. Sebastian Antezana Quiroga is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Hispanic Studies and the Cogut Institute for the Humanities, also affiliated with the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. His book project, Migrant Afterlives, Spectral Narratives of Greater Mexico and Greater Bolivia, explores how specters and other afterlife figures are associated with migrant communities in contemporary literature and film from the Mexican and Bolivian cultural spectrums. Let's start with Brianna. Uh, my work on film and television broadly concerns representations of Blackness in the 21st century, connection and rupture within the African diaspora and transnational casting. In my dissertation project, 
I argue that visual markers of race link representations of Blackness in films and television in the 21st century across political borders and geographies, and that Black creators deliberately use these linkages in subversive ways. The U.S., the wider African diaspora, and the African continent have been in conversation throughout film and television history. Importantly, these interactions accelerated and broadened due to increases in media platforms and the pace of consumer access, beginning in the first decade of the 2000s when online streaming and video services like Netflix and YouTube emerged. Consequentially, contemporary Black production in film and TV is prolific and widely accessible, and I believe deeply embedded in and deeply embedded in and responsive to fractured relational and affective intraracial discourses. Often these conversations hinge on notions of authenticity, truth, and reality, all ideas that conflate Black images with the lived materiality and experience of people marked as Black. Recognizing they cannot avoid these burdens of representation, Black creators play with, contradict, and embrace visual, sonic, and symbolic markers of Blackness. Blackness as a construct is the result of histories of African enslavement and European colonization. At the same time, it is also defined by the changeable conversations amongst Black people about whether they are linked to one another, how to live in a world shaped by anti-Blackness, and how to represent themselves and their histories. Black productions, therefore, are overloaded with historical and social meaning, making the figure of the Black body a problem for the moving image. What is seen on screen is both an individual and the ideation of a Black body burdened with a discourse around Blackness. The individual is flattened into a fantasized shape that is assumed to speak for a broader collection of Blackened beings. The creators I study recognize they cannot escape this problem and consequently must dispute, accept, and negotiate significations of Blackness. Moreover, within their productions, transnational casting brings Black people across political and geographic borders into relation through a recognition of common experience while also negotiating with the visuality of race, which diminishes the appearance of difference between populations. The creators I engage include directors Nia DaCosta, Barry Jenkins, Steve McQueen, Jordan Peele, and Remy Weeks. I consider their work from a few angles. First, I examine creators behind the camera as integral to the creation of subversive images. Second, I discuss the production of Blackness through the images, sounds, and content of film and TV texts, including the work of Black performers. Finally, I discuss how representation is shaped by the commercial nature of media industries. Representations of Blackness are unavoidably shaped by global media conglomerates that often determine how they are produced, financed, and exhibited. In this context, it is too simplistic to assume Black productions maintain a squarely oppositional cultural politics. So how are counter-hegemonic images created and sustained in the 21st century? What are the circumstances and motivations of their production? What distinguishes them from the mainstream? To attempt to answer these questions, I explore transnational diasporic dialogues in film and TV, envisioning them as connected by the desire to liberate Blackness from anti-Black gazes. Black creators transform visual tools into what Sylvia Winter calls cultural counterworlds, or constellations of signs and symbols that emerge when Black people place their own histories at the center of their consciousness. I contend with the production of Blackness as art, entertainment, commercial enterprise, and as a political project aimed at undoing centuries of misrepresentation. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for, for being here today. As uh, Peter indicated, my name is Sebastián Antesana Quiroga, and I am an International Humanities Postdoctoral Fellow in the Department of Hispanic Studies and the Cougar Institute with an affiliation with the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. I am really happy to be here today and to tell you a little about my, my research work. Since the 1970s, several thinkers from the global South have critically analyzed the dilemma of identification processes structured by the form of the nation and have argued that the national model is a non-representative mode of community. At the same time, multiple cultural manifestations have pointed out the contemporary crisis of national identities and cultures what Ramachandra Guha calls the historic failure of the nation to come into its own, which of course implies a necessary rethinking of the links between culture, art, and sociopolitical modes of organization. The Latin American Subaltern Studies Group points out in its founding statement that, quote, the elites represented by the national bourgeoisie and or the colonial administration are responsible for inventing the ideology and reality of nationalism, end of quote. That is, while the, elites, uh, while the elites of the continent command their dest the destinies of their societies with a divisive exclusionary logic, the nation itself is located at the point of intersection between the old 
and Benin, in which elites still occupy a hegemonic role. The national model in Latin America seems to be experiencing a moment of transition in which colonial, post-colonial, and other forces overlap and confuse. Thus, the nation seems to be increasingly less relevant as a model of sociopolitical organization, and instead, new forms are constantly generated, such as binationalism, transnationalism, multinationalism, and even post-nationalism. In my research, I focus specifically on the cases of Mexico and Bolivia and some of their contemporary cultural production, uh, specifically their literature and film, to understand this paradigm shift. Why Mexico and Bolivia? Well, because they are two of the few Latin American societies in which the national model has been most directly challenged, first in the form of true national revolutions, and later by rewriting their national constitutions. In the Mexican case, they have constitutionally adopted a multicultural model that recognizes the partial autonomy of indigenous peoples, and which many consider an initial step to reach multinationalism. And in the Bolivian case, they have constitu constitutionally adopted a multinational model which officially leaves aside the unitary nation. In both cases, the response to, this responds to two factors. The first, a long history of exclusion suffered by Mexican and Bolivian indigenous peoples who were never really part of a Mexican and Bolivian nation. And second, a sustained migration of Mexicans and Bolivians to neighboring countries and the consequent creation of what is called Greater Mexico and what I call Greater Bolivia transnational and diasporic Mexican and Bolivian uh, expressions that transcend their national territories and spill into neighboring societies. Perhaps curiously, in the last four decades, cultural manifestations such as the literature and, and cinema of Greater Mexico, Greater Bolivia, have begun representing their migrant communities and, as specters and ghosts, figures that return from death to disjoin the political and cultural coordinates, coordinates of their present. Now, why is this happening? How can we understand this seemingly coordinated choice? In my work, I argue that these afterlife figures appear as spectral embodiments of the tensions that challenge the nation because they're strategic responses to the realization that although the national paradigm has been declared obsolete and in some cases have been, has been constitutionally declared inviable, it still remains present, sustained in the practices, traditions, beliefs, and worldviews of these societies, like a specter that that does not renounce the world of the living. Thus, while on the one hand, the aforementioned and viability of the national paradigm has long been declared and even celebrated in Mexico and Bolivia, on the other, it still remains, even as the ruinous ghostly shell of what it was meant to be, and not for that diminished or less prevalent in the ways people from greater Bolivia and greater Mexico understand and process everyday life. My goal as a postdoctoral fellow at the Cogut Institute is to study the complex ways in which art anticipates, accompanies, and examines this ghost of the nation. I'm very happy and excited about being able to do so in the coming years. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. This is such a rich array of projects, and I very much look forward to seeing them evolve in conversation during our seminar throughout the fall. Videos of this evening's talks will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, where you can also find videos from previous editions of Meet the Fellows. The Cogut Institute has exciting events lined up for this year. The series Experimental Ethnographies, which emerges from one of the Collaborative Humanities graduate seminars, starts on October 5 with a talk by theater director and playwright Melissa Mosquito, titled Investigative Theater, Activating Source Material and Negotiating Narrative. And the first environmental humanities talk of the year will be on October 17. Rutgers scholar J.T. Rowan will discuss the work of author June Jordan and how it calls for local responses to global crises. You can find links to these events and the full events lineup in the chat right now. And I want to thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. We hope to see you very soon at the Cogut Institute events. Thank you. <laughs>